must keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free. ready. Dr. Wallace, come and preach to us tonight. It's been a real joy to have him with us. And it just amazes me, uh, the energy and the strength that he has in his preaching. And uh, we're very, very grateful for you. God All right. You. Thank you, Pastor. Didn't you enjoy the Backwoods Brothers Trio? <laughs> Wasn't that good? I enjoyed it. And do you notice that uh, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Fittis sings Without, a, uh, without an Irish brogue. I didn't hear the Irish coming. So I'm going to recommend you sing your sermons. <laughs> it's interesting, but that, that's, that's a common thing that you, you can sing something that you cannot say and you can say things you cannot sing, but that's interesting. We're going to Acts chapter 9 tonight. Uh, this morning we started in the New Testament with that verse on being fully furnished. And then we went back to the Old Testament and saw where God put that same thought in the Old Testament with the furnishing of that prophet's chamber. Tonight we want to do the same thing with Acts chapter 9. And Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus was on his way to arrest Christians and maybe kill some of them and put some of them in prison. And the Bible says now back in verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly... Now suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven, 
And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? That is an interesting question. Who art thou, Lord? If he knew it was the Lord, why did he call him? Why did he say, Who art thou? And uh, he uh, asked, Who art thou? Uh, and he didn't seem to know, but, but the, really the way to understand that is he said, who art thou? Lord. He got saved between the word thou and the word Lord. No man can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's an interesting thought. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do now it's interesting the next line says the lord said to him you arise and go into the city and it will be told you what to do now there is a pattern here that you and i can greatly benefit from the lord said uh, saul uh yes sir uh i want you to go into the city and somebody there will tell you what to do in other words you don't need to worry about what I'm getting ready to tell you. You just take the first step. And when he took the first step, then it began to open up. And when he took the second step, it opened up further. Now, I want you to go back now to Genesis 22. And we're going to hear the Lord speaking to Abraham. And uh, <clears throat> the Bible says in Genesis 22, verse 1, And it came to pass... After these things that God did tempt Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Now, when the Lord called out Abraham, he did something he did over and over again. There are other places in the Bible where he said, Noah. And Noah said, Yes, Lord. He said, Noah, I have something I want you to do. Uh, what is it? I want you to build me an ark. Now, Right then, Noah could have asked a thousand questions because there had never been an ark. He could have said, what is an ark, Lord? Well, it's a boat. What's a boat, Lord? And never been a boat. You see, he had no answers to any other questions. The first thing he said is, Lord, here am I. And Abraham said, here am I. And uh, you'll check through the scripture. Uh, every time the Lord spoke, and I could give you at least a dozen times, the Lord spoke to little Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, he ran and said, Here am I, Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? Uh, in this case, the Lord said, Saul, yes, sir. Uh, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to go down to Ananias' house, and he is going to tell you what to do. Step number two is to listen to step number one without knowing anything about. Now, listen to this. It says in verse one, it came to pass after these things. Now, you and I know, and I'll not uh, read all of the scriptures because we're very familiar with this. But the Lord was getting ready to ask him to go up on the mountain and take Isaac and drive a knife through his body and kill him and cut him up in pieces and put him on a big pile of wood on a stone and set him on fire and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Now, let me ask you, what would you do if the Lord said, uh, Tom, Bill, Sam, Pete, Henry? Yes, sir, Lord. What Abraham said was, Lord, I have no idea what you're getting ready to ask me to do, but here I am. Now, let me tell you what that means. That means that you and I, if we really are serious Christians and the Lord says, Tom, and I say, yes, Lord, here I am. What I'm saying is I'm going to take an eight and a half by 14 legal size piece of paper that's blank on both sides. And I'm going to turn it over on my desk and get my pen and I'm going to sign it down on the bottom right hand corner and I'm going to hand it to God. What's he going to put on it? I have no idea. When? Don't know. Where? Don't know. How much? I don't know. What salary going to be? I don't know. What kind of house can I live in? I have no idea. What kind of car can I drive? Will there be a retirement? Do I have any insurance? None of those questions are answered. I worked for General Motors in 1950, and the Lord said, Tom, and I said, yes, sir. Uh, he said, I have something I want you to do. I said, all right, I'll do it. He said, I want you to quit your job at General Motors, and I want you to sell your brand new house Take your wife and baby and go to Bible college. I want you to be a preacher. And I said, Lord, uh, that's not what I had in mind. I was going to be president of General Motors. I was going to do such a good job on the assembly line that they were going to vote. They're going to, they're going to promote me up to, uh, to, to be the foreman of the trim shop. 
And then I was going to do such a good job in the trim shop that they were going to make me, uh, you know, the plant superintendent. And then I would excel in that. And they'd say, boy, that fellow really got something. We're going to put him out in Detroit. And we're going to put him on the 10th floor and give him 10 secretaries and a $10 million salary every year. And I had that all figured out. <laughs> and the Lord said, Tom, yes, sir. I want you to quit your job and sell your house and go to Bible college. And uh, I had to decide whether or not I would do what the Lord said. And I told him, okay, I'll do it. <clears throat> now, now I want to show you Abraham had a system of approaching this, but I want to point this out first. It came to pass after these things. Now, we'd have to go back to Genesis 12 to see what things. Because in Genesis 12, the Lord said, Abraham, yes, sir, I got something I want you to do. Okay, will you do it? Yes. Okay, here's what it is. I want you to pack up your suitcase, and I want you to get a U-Haul truck. Take some camels, of course. You can't do it with trucks, but get your camels together. Take all your sheep and your oxen. Take a bunch of your family members. Get Lot and go with you. And I want you to take off down toward a place called Cana. And... Uh, uh, yeah, but Lord, what about, no, never mind, just take off, and I want you to go and look for a city whose builder and maker is God. None of the questions were answered. The Lord said, here's what I want you to do, and Abraham said, here am I. That means he signed the sheet and handed it to God, and God said, okay, if you're willing to do anything I want you to do, now here's what I want you to do. And Abraham started obeying. As he went year by year, he made a couple of mad decisions. He ended up where God wanted. He said, now, if you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to uh, give you the seed. You're going to have children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, great, 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 great. And they're going to be like the stars in the sky and the and sand of the seashore. You're going to have millions and millions of great, 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 great grandchildren if you do what I tell you. And if you don't do what I tell you, nobody will ever have heard of Abraham. If Abraham hadn't listened to God, there would be no Abraham in your Bible. If Saul hadn't listened to the Lord, you would not know about Saul. And none of the people in the Bible would have ever been heard of by people like you and me in churches if they hadn't obeyed the voice of God. Now, God has a purpose, and the Bible says all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. And God has a purpose for me and for you. I don't care what age you are. I don't care what sex you are. I don't care how much uh, uh, education you have or how much finance. God has a purpose for you to fulfill. And if you can find the will of God and be in it, then God's blessings will be upon you. And Deuteronomy 27 and 28 says, if you do this, you'll be blessed in your coming and blessed in your going and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And if you don't, you'll be cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed and cursed. And it would pay to read those chapters and think about how that applies. Now, also, let me mention this in the way of building a foundation is <clears throat> that um, the Lord... Uh, wants me uh, to be able to fulfill the role that he has for me. And he has put all the stories in the Old Testament to help me do that. Now, the story of Abraham is not about Abraham. It's about me and you. And I mentioned this morning, the story of Job is not about Job. And the story of David is not about David. And the story of Daniel is not about Daniel. And the story of Hebrew children is not about these things are about me. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 says the things that happen to the people in the Old Testament happen to them for our examples and for our end samples. And so when you read the Bible, instead of reading about David, read uh, thinking about you and you be Abraham. Now, how would you react if the Lord said, Abraham, I got something more to do. Okay, will you do it? Yes. I don't, uh, don't matter about the... Uh, Salary, don't matter about the benefits, the insurance, or the retirement, no, don't matter about any of it. Okay, here it is. Take your boy up on a mountain and kill him. <laughs> yeah, but Lord, you said that through my son Isaac, there would be the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, and there'd be thousands of millions of grandchildren, great grandchildren. Now, remember, uh, Abraham had no idea what was coming. Now, you and I know what's coming, and we're going to. 
uh, we're, we're going to understand a little bit better. But I want you to know that he had no idea what God was going to do. And the Bible says God was testing him. Now, God never intended to have Isaac slain. But he tested Abraham to see whether or not he would move according to his commandment, even if he didn't understand it. Now, if you go back to Genesis 12, we see the Lord making him his promise. He said, I want you to take off down toward Canaan land, and I'm going to give you a great, great country, and I'm going to uh, uh, do all kinds of good things for you. And the Bible says that uh, Abraham got tired of waiting on God's promise for this little boy Isaac to be born. Here he is 100 years old now, and Sarah is 90-some years old. And he says, you're going to have a baby. How'd you like to try to believe that? And, uh, and here's what's going to happen when that happens. And then and he had to go through that. And then uh, Sarah said, Abraham, I'm too old to have a baby. How about you take my handmaiden and get a baby by her? Because she's a lot younger than I am. And, 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 that, and they had to go through that kind of a thing. And that's a matter of not trusting the Lord for his perfect will. And you know the result was conflict and trouble. Those two women in the home couldn't get along. And when the two babies were born, those babies got in a fight. They couldn't get along. And there was all kind of frustrations and everything. And then, you know, the story is that each chapter has more problems. Sarah ran Hagar off. And we get this little boy and he's going to go out there and he's about to die. And Abraham, that's his son too, you know. And he's got a broken heart about that. And uh, then the Lord says, uh, uh, now, uh, we're going to... Uh, I uh, have to go out here with, uh, as we go, Lot's going to have his cattlemen, and I'm going to have my cattlemen. They're both very, very wealthy, and hundreds of cows and sheep and goats. And the cattlemen get into a fight, and they've got to have some kind of union meetings and all this matter, trying to settle the argument between. And they said, okay, you go that way, and I'll go this way. And then Lot goes down to Sodom, and Sodom gets invaded, and all, all of his family gets carried away by a heathen tribe who are going to make slaves and servants out of the children, and they're going to use the women for maids and probably going to rape a bunch of the women. And the Lord said, Abraham, get you an army together and go down. And Abraham had to go through all that. And all that is saying that the Lord was sending Abraham to school to get him ready for Genesis 22 because he wasn't ready from 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. And you and I won't be ready for some of the things the Lord wants us to do until he allows us to go through some other experiences. And that's why all things are working together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And so instead of saying, Lord, I don't know why I have to go through this. It's not fair, Lord, because the rest of them are not going through this. And some of you felt that way when you got COVID and maybe when your house burned down or when the tornado or the hurricane came through or when you had the car wreck or when a, a baby died or when something else happened or maybe somebody went wayward or maybe your mate betrayed you and you felt like the world's coming apart. No, no, the Lord is letting you as a Christian, if you're a good Christian, he's letting you go through some schooling and training, getting you ready for his calling because he wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour out his blessings on you. And he can't do it till he gets you right where he wants you to be. So Abraham, yes, sir. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Now, I want to divide this up into uh, several, uh, several basics here. Uh, first of all, I want you to see that the call comes directly down from God himself. I call it orders from headquarters. In verse 1 and 2, the Lord said in 1 and 2, it came to pass that after these things, God tested Abraham. And he said, Abraham, behold, here am I. I'll sign the sheet. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering up on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, I don't know what the Lord's going to ask you to do. He asked me to sell my house, quit my job, and go to Bible college. And after 72 years, I am so thrilled that I did it. I'm almost sure I'd be in my grave right now working at General Motors, trying to get a promotion and fussing and fighting with all the problems that you have and trying to age with all of that and all the habits I would have picked up and so forth. But I, I'm confident and I've had lots of other experiences that I can share, but that's enough to get the point across that the Lord's, it's, it's his hell. Now, the Bible calls this the will of God for my life. 
Now let me ask you, do you know what the will of God is? John 17, 7 says, If any man will to know his will, he shall know, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He's saying, you can know whether it's God's idea or whether it's your idea. Now a lot of it, shall I buy that house? Better talk to God about it. We were having a missionary conference and we talked to our folks about the faith promise plan. And I really pushed on, and the missionaries did too, about we, we want you to get the mind of God. And we want to support missionaries according to God's will for our church. And we said, we want everybody to pray and ask the Lord what he would like. We don't want to try to talk you in or sell you something or try to raise a bunch of money. We just want you to get the mind of God. Whether it's just a, a, a little bit or whether it's a whole lot, the Lord knows you. He knows, your, he knows what he's going to do for you, and he, he, he has that all settled. I said, would there be anybody here that, that has any leadings? Now, we've been talking about this for several days. And one guy stuck his hand. He said, yes, sir, preacher. The Lord has definitely told me to raise an acre of tomatoes for him. I said, really? He said, he just put it in the heart, right out of the clear blue sky. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to raise them, and I'm going to sell the tomatoes, and I'm going to give every penny of the profit to our faith mission. And the guy smiled, he stuck his hand up. He said, the Lord told me to raise a steer. Really? And then I had a, a businessman who had seven businesses. And he was a multi-millionaire. He came to Sunday school in a helicopter on Sunday. <laughs> and he was sitting out there. And he said, uh, Preacher, this may sound strange, but he said, you, you know that my wife and I are, are very fluent, and we have every penny that we'd ever need for anything. But he said, I got a guy who's a friend of mine, and he, he tells me that his business is going bankrupt. And he came to me, and he said... Uh, uh, I know I'm about ready to lose my shirt. And if you would, that guy's name, he said, John, if, if, if you would buy my business, I'm sure with your resources and with your management skills and people that work with you, you could turn this business around and you could make it go and you could make it very successful. And he said, the guy approached me about that. And then I came in here and the preachers and the missionaries been talking about this. And he said, the Lord told me to buy that business. And he said, I don't need any of the money. But he said he told me that he would turn it around for me and he wanted me to put every penny of the markup or of the profits of that business into the mission program of our church. And he did it. And uh, he just and, and he started he started giving uh, he built a big building on a college campus and he started building this and building he, he built the church and paid it off and all that. Stuff. And, and he said, the Lord told me to do it. Now, now, now that's different. For, but, but anyway, and there are more and more stories like it. But anyhow, the, the direction comes from God. Now, should uh, should I marry this person that I'm interested in or is it just am I getting carried away with infatuation? I like the color of her eyes or her hair, or I like her smile, or I, I think I'm in love with her. Yeah. Does God have a plan? And do you pray about that and make that a matter? Or do I make a judgment on whether or not, I, you know, or do I make a judgment on whether I accept his proposal or not? You better get the mind of God about that if you want to find fulfillment and happiness. Should I take a job? I had a man come into my office one day and he said, uh, Preacher, uh, I, I, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. And he said, uh, uh, I've been reading about your church here in Murfreesboro. And he said, uh, uh, I've heard about your school. And he said, uh, I'm considering moving here and joining your church and putting my children in your school. I said, you're you, you getting transferred from of your job? He said, no, no, my job has nothing to do with this. I'm not coming here for a job. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a dentist. I said, do you have a place? He said, no, no, I'll have to open an office and create my own living here. But he said, I'm not coming here for that. I'm coming here to get the benefits of your church. I want my family in a church like this. And I want my kids in a school like this. Now, that was about 15 years ago. He did it. He's one of the deacons now in our church. He's still there. And uh, he made the move because God told him, you, you do this because of your kids and because of your family. Not make a financial decision. Will it make me wealthy or will it be successful? He said, let's do this with God. Now, that's when God speaks, God has that kind of motive. God wants, he loves me, he loves you, he wants to do good things for us. 
Now, he wants us to get to the spiritual level that I talked about this morning where we can hear the voice of God. Because the book of Hebrews talks about those who have become dull of hearing. And if he said, Abraham, Abraham, if Abraham been dull of hearing, he wouldn't have heard God. And there would have been no story of Abraham. And if you and I don't hear God because we're not spiritual enough to recognize the call of God when he speaks, then nobody will ever know about us either. And we'll not, we'll live and eat and sleep and breathe and die and go lay in the end and, and we, and, and all that. When we get to judgment seat, it'll all be plain. Anyway, the orders comes down from headquarters. Now, the second thing happens is obedience springs up from the heart. If a person is a genuine Christian and God speaks to them and says, Tom, I want you to quit your job and sell your house and go to be, a, I want you to be a preacher. My heart just bubbled. The idea was just thrilling to me. I could be a preacher. I had a guy who had led me to the Lord and he, he was a young preacher just getting started. And he was telling me how exciting it was and all he got me. So, and, and the Lord used him to just get me. And when the Lord spoke to me about this, now, you know, I'd been to church that Sunday and I came home and laid down on the couch and I was reading the phony papers. <laughs> Snuffy Smith and all, and all that stuff. <laughs> and suddenly the thought came on me that the Lord wanted me to preach and I could do it. And my heart just, just bubbled. Now, this is any, anybody who is right with the Lord and the Lord speaks, and you know it's the Lord moving in your heart, there's going to be an excitement about it. So the orders comes, the Lord speaks to me, and my heart moves with joy and thrill. Number three, objection from the head. Logic sets in. What are you going to do about your house? What are you going to do about your job? How are you going to handle it when your wife says, I'm going to divorce you? I didn't marry a preacher. I married a guy that works at General Motors. Uh, you see, automatically, logic and reasoning sets in, and we start thinking about, what are you going to say when your father-in-law says, Tom, you've lost your mind. If I'd known you was going to do something stupid like that, I wouldn't let you marry my daughter. And my mom and dad said, Tom, are you serious? you you gone crazy. And, and the objection begins to come and your head says, I don't know if I've got the mind of God about this or not. You mark it down. Anytime you make a decision for Lord, there's going to be some objective people around and it's going to come out of your own philosophy because you and I are both loaded with Plato and our solemn Socrates and Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, because we've been to public school and we've listened to television and we've read the newspapers and we are so indoctrinated that it's hard for us to be spiritual. So the orders come down from God. The heart just jumps with joy. Now, if you want an example of that, when Mary walked into Elizabeth's house, both women were pregnant. And the Bible says when Mary was carrying the incarnated God in her body and little John the Baptist, who's waiting to be born, leaped with joy. And that's what happens when a person hears the call of God. It just thrills your soul. And then comes the objection of what am I going to do about that? What am I going to do about that? How am I going to make a living? What am I going to do about money? What am I going to do about? What am I going to do about? And boy, now, okay, there's a fourth thing. And that is the offering. Now, by the way, I, I wanted to read verse 3 about the, uh, about the obedience from the heart. Abraham rose up early in the morning. Now, he didn't lollygig around until late afternoon and say, well, I better get started doing what God's called me to do. No, sir. He's excited about this. And so he gets up before daylight and gets these people all together and gets Isaac out of bed. And they head off because this is major. This is important. Then he's going to do what God says. So that's obedience in the heart. Now, look at the objection where uh, in verse 7, it says that uh, in verse 7, it says, and Isaac spoke to Abraham. Now, as they travel along, he said to his father, my father, he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, we got the fire and we got the wood. But where's the lamb? There's always a question. What are we going to do about a lamb sacrifice? Abraham knows it's going to be Isaac, but Isaac don't know it. Nobody else knows it. 
And there's always going to be questions. So this is where the objection comes when my logic and reasoning sets in. Now, number four is verse 10. He makes his offering with his hand. He says, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He said, I'm going to do this. He decided and he goes into motion to carry out the plan of God. He had no idea that the Lord is going to have a ram caught in the bushes and substitute it. And you and I have no idea when God asks us to do something that looks impossible, sounds strange to us. We just wonder how in the world could this ever come into my mind to start with. And then the Lord always steps in by faith. OK, and we read Hebrews 11 and see by faith in every person missed it. Now, verse 10, it says <clears throat> it's time to go. He said, um, what are we going to do about the ram? OK, and so he's ready to do it regardless. And he makes an offering. He's going to go through with it. Now, verse 11 he gives us the next thought observation from heaven. Look at verse 11. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I. He's still ready, willing. Now, you know what was going on? An angel was looking down on it. Not just one angel, but probably 10,000 of them. And not only angels, but my mother's up there looking down, making, watching my decisions. And my wife is up there. My first wife died after 52 years. Mary and I have been married 18 years now but my wife is up there i've got a sister up there and i've got a lot of friends i've buried several hundred people and a lot of them and folks up there and in the book of hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 pictures it as a great grandstand filled with people and i'm down on the playing field and they're rooting for me come on tom come on tom make the right decision now don't blow it don't blow it Okay, maybe just a little decision about which school my kid's going to go to. If I send them over to that state university, they can get a Ph.D. And man, they can make a good living and have a good. Yeah, but but they'll become atheists and they'll curse your God. You better you better think. And the Lord puts on your heart. You better send them to a Bible college and get some scriptural foundation under them. See, and when the Lord gets into it, he will help me with my decision. And so there are people up in heaven angels and God himself and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all the prophets and all of the disciples and all of our loved ones and friends who've gone on before. They're up there watching us, looking and hoping and rooting for us and praying that we will make a right decision. Observation from heaven. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open under their cry. God is looking. And then number six. There is occasion for God's help. Look in verse 13. Verse 13 says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, you and I know this was going to happen, so we didn't get real nervous about it. But Abraham didn't know this. Now, what I want to point out, that Abraham provided an opportunity for the supernatural to step in and work the miracle that God had planned. And if he hadn't turned aside and he hadn't obeyed, there wouldn't be any miracle. There wouldn't have been a ram and there wouldn't have been an Abraham in your Bible. Okay. We have to provide, and the Lord sends us some suggestions from his throne and when we take a step of faith, the supernatural overrides the natural and works the miracle. I have a sermon on miracles, and I have a whole page of supernatural miracles in my life and ministry. And any time I get a little bit wobbly, I just go back and rethink about the time when God did this and God did that and God did that. And there's no other explanation that could be given and anybody who's really been involved, all the missionaries can tell you stories about how God worked a miracle for them. Now, God is a miracle working God, and he is the same yesterday and today and forever. 
And we say, well, he did it in the New Testament, then in the Old Testament. But this is, a, yeah, I know, but God never changes. He's immutable, and he's the same God. And he is looking to provide a miracle to increase and encourage my faith. If you read John chapter 20 and verse 21, 22, it says, And Jesus did all the many other signs, other miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee, but these are done in order that they might believe. That's the reason he sets us up. And then when we respond positively, he brings a supernatural miracle and then we believe from then on, it's not so hard to do what he says. And so here we have the occasion for his help. And then the most important thought is finally. Don't you like that word? <laughs> Don't you wish we preachers knew what that word meant? <laughs> finally, opportunities for his heirs. Look in verse 17 and 18. It says that in blessing, I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sands which are upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. He said, you've given me an occasion to work a miracle. And as a result of it, your children are going to turn out right. And your grandchildren are going to be a blessing to you. And your great-grandchildren. And your great, 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 great. And Abraham, there are going to be millions of them. All of them dependent upon your decision. And that same thing's true of me and you. When Ernie Haybacker led me to Christ, I was the only Christian. Now, we had religious people in our family. But I'm the only one that got saved at that time. Now, since that time... Just lots of them got saved. But all four of our kids got saved. And all of them went to Bible college. And now they got grand I got grandchildren. And now we got bunches of great grandchildren. I got all kinds. Somebody asked me the other day if I was a senior citizen. I said, man, I got four kids that are senior citizens. <laughs> but my, my boy Tim, who was a pastor of a church down in Alabama, he said, Dad, I've been thinking about that fellow Ernie Haybacker that led you to Christ. He sure did our family a big favor, didn't he? He said, they're just they're the 50, 75, almost 100 of us that are saved because he led you to Jesus. Now, we're only down to the great grandchildren. But there's coming, if the Lord tarries, there's going to be great, 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 great. And every one of them is going to be influenced and affected by the grandpas and the and the moms and dads and the children. And the same thing's true of you. Whether your great-grandchildren go to heaven or not, it's going to depend on how you conduct your Christian life. And if you get selfish and greedy and do all those seven sins we talked about, you, you, you'll live for yourself, just me, my, I, what I want. I don't want to do that. I don't care what God thinks about it. Your great-great-grandchildren are going to go to hell and burn like a fire because of your decision, if I understand what that's saying. So the responsibility that falls on our shoulder is, is just unbelievable. And the blessings that are possible, um, I was telling uh, the uh, pastor that my mother was a Paisley, and the Paisleys are Irish. And I did a family tree study. Uh, my uh, cousin, my third cousin, John Paisley, pastors out in Washington State. And we got together and we got their family tree out and we went back generations and generations. And we discovered that our great, 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 great grandfathers and all were bishops and priests and religious leaders in Ireland. And I have an idea. I, I'm guessing I don't know anything about this. I've got to do a lot more study and I'll have to wait till I get to heaven. But their influence probably filtered down. And found its way into my philosophy somehow, or in my genes. And so that when Ernie Haybacker came along with the gospel, I was open. And didn't have a wall up. And didn't reject Christ. And I have an idea that it was way back there that it started. Now, we are dealing with the future of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren. That's what I see in this. Now, remember, 
The things that happened to Abraham in the Old Testament happened unto him for our example and for our ensamples. And so when you read the Bible, don't read the Bible. Study the Bible and meditate therein day and night. And, you know, now we have, we have a bad, bad habit. We think, well, you know, listen, that happened 4,000 years ago, and that's 10,000 miles away from here. And what in the world does that have to do with me here in this church? I'll tell you, it has everything in the world to do with you and me. And so I need to realize that these stories have put in the Bible for our admonition and for our understanding. And then let me repeat, the, the higher I get spiritually, the quicker I'll realize and the more I'll see of it, the better I'll understand it and the more profit and the better I'll be off financially, mentally, emotionally, socially, dom domestically, and then spiritually, and then eternally. So that's what Genesis 22 has to say to me. I hope you can see that too. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, thank you for all that you have to say to us. And Lord, we know that the stories of uh, David killing Goliath has a lot of truth just like that. And we know that Noah building that ark just has to do a lot with the way we live at our house and in our neighborhood and the church we go to. And Daniel in the lines then and Hebrew children and Samson and all of every one of them have so much to do. And then when we get in the New Testament and see it plain through Peter and Paul and James and John and Stephen. Oh, Lord, help us now. We love you. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please.